Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science. It's one of the incredible ironies of the Chris Watts case that while you have this incredible, almost unprecedented amount of information, it's almost as if we're missing a lot of information. And there seems to be a kind of a mindfuckery in that, in that by almost overloading um, the public with this deluge of information that, that we received, um, we would then not suspect that, well, what isn't being released, right? And so in this episode, we're going to be dealing specifically with that, um, with the unanswered questions, the complete list of information missing from the Chris Watts case. Before we get to that, uh, please subscribe, like, share, ring the bell and leave a comment and let's get started. Now I don't know about you but whenever there's a some kind of mainstream treatment of the Chris Watts case, whether it's a special on Dr. Phil, a show on Dr. Oz, a documentary, a book, <laughs> and certainly from my perspective um, pretty much um, most experts that, that sort of weigh in on, on this case, there's always a sense of frustration, um, there's always a sense of disappointment and that has to do with um, the fact that there, there doesn't seem to be um, expertise and there doesn't seem to be um, a proper um, analysis um, you know, of this particular narrative. Now. Um, True Crime Rocket Science has attempted to fill that vacuum. Um, I think we've done that successfully. Um, when I say we, I mean me as an author and and you as the community, uh, especially the community of readers and especially the community reading the, the books. Um, but it's still not um, mainstream. And so there are so many areas in the mainstream where because there are all these holes that's being sort of plugged by opportunistic um, you know youtubers and and whatnot um, but it's one thing to gripe about those holes it's another thing to try to fill them and to try to address them and so we're going to try and do that in this video the issue of the complete list of information missing um, isn't actually new um, funnily enough I got a comment on a blog post um, satirizing in a way the five insights in the latest Dr. Oz show um, and that made me that sort of just reminded me um, how long this crater in the middle of the Watts case has been going on so on Crime Rocket on December 27th 2018 um, I put up this this post about the c complete set of information missing now bear in mind December 27th was basically a week and sorry not a week um, one month and about 10 odd days um, after the release of the discovery the discovery was released November 19 and um, around about a month later, a month and, and uh, eight days later, um, this blog post sort of came out. So you can sort of see from that that after five weeks, um, it was sort of clear that, um, you know, having sifted through the, the discovery, it was clear that something wasn't there. Um, and not just one something, quite a few somethings. So let's just go into that. Um, again, just bear in mind this blog post was written um, almost a year ago. So um, let's let's try to see whether, um, based on a review of it, how much um, has changed since it was written. Are, are you ready? Here we go. The discovery documents are an impressive mountain of information. As haystacks go, it's a colossal cauldron of information. 
but where are the needles? Below is a comprehensive list of needles missing from the giant haystack that is the Watts case file. Number one, Shanann's financial records with proof of income. In brackets, it may be that Lavelle holds some sort of contractual obligation that keeps these records confidential, but would that obligation continue after death? So I wonder whether some people who are ex-Lavelle employees or um, um, MLMers who would be able to answer that question. Um, is there some sort of legal stranglehold that, that um, would prevent Shanann's financial records from being revealed? Um, and if so, it would be good to actually see it in the contract. Then number two, Chris Watts's bank statements. Um, we have no idea what the exact financial circumstances were of the Watts family. We have some idea what they were in 2015 and we have some idea what the expenses were but we don't really have a clear um, kind of balance sheet you know going, going on. Number three, the computer browser histories of Shanann and Chris Watts. Number four, the ring doorbell footage of Shanann Watts arriving at the front door of 2825 Saratoga Trail at 0148 on August 13th. And so we can see here, um, he has a fascinating sort of example of intratextuality. That's, that's in contrast to intertextuality. Um, intratextuality refers to within the same text and inter is referring to um, uh, references in the same um, sort of region, the same sort of topic or whatever, but across different, um, let's call it texts, but in this case we mean cases. So intratextuality is really referring to the fact that within the Watts case, within the um, archive of the Watts case, we had a, a, a situation where we didn't have the ring doorbell footage and then we did. But it's easy to forget that at one point we didn't have it, right? So as late as um, December 27th, uh, when this blog post came up, it was sort of being queried, where is it? And um, one of the reasons um, people were wondering was because we knew it, it existed. It wasn't a case that we were sort of speculating that it should exist. We knew it existed because it was referred to in the discovery documents. So we knew it was there, and then, but we also knew that it it wasn't. Well, I won't say it wasn't there, but it it was there, but it wasn't um, hadn't been released to the public. Now we're going to circle back to the ring doorbell footage in a moment, but before we do, let's just note that it when it was eventually released was around about February the twenty first, right? So um, two months after that blog post and just a few days after the um, the second confession th the doorbell footage was sort of unexpectedly released and um, I remember just thinking at the time that it was quite odd how at the same time you that the second confession came out which was also a surprise you also had the surprise of the release of the ring doorbell footage and my impression certainly was that the release of the, of the ring doorbell footage almost swamped the awareness. Um, bearing, bear in mind the release of the second confession was delayed. There was, it was sort of announced and then delayed. But then the release of the ring doorbell footage was sort of announced and provided to the public. And so people really sort of um, got very preoccupied by that. And I don't know whether um, this was intentional, whether people thought maybe thought that they wouldn't then pay that much attention to the second confession. Bear in mind, the second confession contradicted what the district attorney said. There were details in it that um, um, contradicted what the district attorney said. Bear in mind that the video aspect in terms of the neighbor um, was now being also contradicted by with what Watts was saying, right? You know, because of the whole um, shadows dancing in the driveway scenario. And so this this release of the second video was almost 
um, a kind of way to to either shift the narrative or just to get people talking about something else. That was certainly my impression. I don't know what yours was. In any event, returning to this list, um, number five, Chris Watts's Facebook pa- posts, and uh, again, this is another area that's very distorted in the Chris Watts narrative. What I mean is, um, we see Shanann Watts' social media. We see all her perspectives. We see her um, videos. We see her selfies and so on. Um, we don't see anything like that from Chris Watts. We don't see his social media. Now, one could argue that he didn't have social media and even that his Facebook account sort of didn't exist. But the fact is he did have some social media. He had um, a Twitter page. Um, his last two posts were sort of um, a few artifacts from his last two Twitter, not post tweets, were um, recorded. Uh, sorry, not even that is accurate. Uh, they weren't really tweets. It was just him liking um, two to um, sports sort of events. One was on the uh, 11th of August and it was what's I think liking a tweet by Brandon Stokely um, where Stokely tweeted it's a walk off wow what a finish at the Rockies big time win man that was great um, it's almost as if um, what what was doing there was um, pretending through the tweet to be at the Rockies game, and we know he wasn't. But obviously, he needed to be aware of the game so that he could lie about it. Um, and then there's another tweet um, that he he um, I think liked um, on the 12th, um, where Gary sorry Jerry Dulac um, tweeted, "I've maintained for years Tiger Woods would never win another major." because his body health would never cooperate. Um, I don't mind saying I could be wrong about what I've seen. And then what? what's, uh, I think, like that tweet. That was on the 12th. And uh, Tiger Woods was playing golf that day, and uh, it went on quite late into the afternoon. So we actually know what Watts was thinking about and where his mind was late in the afternoon, even after the birthday party. And um, we know one of the officers when they entered the residence, uh, I think it was Tuesday, s- saw that a television was on on a sports show. So, And we know that Watts was interested in sport. He talks about golf with his father in, in his letters to Cadel. Uh, but the whole the point is, the whole this is just a tiny snapshot of the social media narrative and, and it provides so much insight and yet that is missing. And what I always find fascinating in these cases is you sort of have this whole social media existence, this whole virtual identity, and then as soon as a crime is committed, uh, then suddenly it disappears, right? But not only does it disappear, the people who were part of that person's network, they also disappear. You don't see any of them putting up their hands saying, oh, I was um, one of... Chris Watts' Twitter followers and dot 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 or I was one of I was Chris Watts' friend on Facebook and I can tell you dot 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 you just don't hear that and that's that's very telling it's very telling that, that those people simply just disappear and they don't have anything to say when everyone's thinking and you know asking questions Uh, number six was the contents of Chris Watts' secret calculator app. Um, arguably, uh, that has also been released since this post went up. But to be fair, um, I think it would be sort of accurate to say that only some of it has gone up. Um, we know that you know some of the information uh, from the uh, visit to the sand dunes um, you know we've seen some of the video there and so on but that's just a fraction of what was sent between Watts and Kessinger for a long long period of time it's a fraction of it number seven crime scene photos of the inside of Chris Watts's truck number eight crime scene photos of the inside of the Lexus 
And by the way, when you say crime scene photos, we don't mean just sort of body cam. We mean actual crime scene photos. Um, number nine, clarity on the owner, the leasing company of the Lexus. I think that information has also been established uh, since this went up. Number 10, details of the plea deal, including Watts' confession of his bogus confession in exchange for the plea deal. Okay, uh, why is there no genuine investigation into the motive in this case? Um, there has been a little bit of information on the plea deal. Um, I think in the Devil in Disguise this documentary or um, Family Man, Family Murderer, one of those, uh, some details of the plea deal did come out. Um, something that, that came out in that, that that was sort of quite slyly revealed was when the email was actually sent. Um, and it was around about August 26th, I believe. Um, the, so we actually have the actual email that was sent for the first time. Um, but at the, at the time that this came out, we didn't know that. And it's, it's just odd that w you wouldn't know a simple thing like that. Why not just be honest about it? Number 11, confirmation of Shanann's medical conditions via official medical certificates. So we don't even know what Shanann's actual medical status was. Um, a seemingly benign question to ask at this point. Number 12, a proper analysis of the crime scene in terms of the Vivint security system and its potential flaws. Number 13, clear footage of the basement area, including Watts' bed. We've got footage, it's just not very clear. Um, number 14, an inventory of the medicines, etc. stockpiled in the basement. Now, I think you will agree with me how prescient this particular point was. Bear in mind, again, it was uh, compiled um, uh, almost a year ago, and this was before anything was mentioned in the public, in you know um, the mainstream about oxycodone or oxycontin. Um, I see in a video between Scott Reich and um, Cadel, both of them acknowledge they didn't even know there was anything in the discovery or any any thing about oxycodone and yet uh, it was in the discovery all along so that that's also something that's kind of interesting is how things were lurking in the discovery um, but not really acknowledged in the way that you'd expect you know authorities like the FBI and the CBI and a lead detective um, to bring about so you know you can disclose but with with with, with uh, in a way a, a kind of disclose in a misleading way, right? Number 15, um, what was inside the black refrigerator and were there any other refrigerators or freezers in the basement? I'm not going to deal with that here, but um, yeah, there, w there was more than one refrigerator. There were certainly two and there may have been a, one of them may have been a freezer. Number 16, where did Dieter usually sleep or eat? Number 17, clear confirmation, such as via graphic representation of those areas in the Watts home where dogs alerted to cadaver odor and or signs of a struggle. You know, I've covered quite a few crimes um, and invariably there are infographics showing this is where the dogs alerted. Uh, there's been no such thing in the Chris Watts case, which is just weird. Number 18, audio of the 911 call made by Nicole Atkinson. Um, and then there's an edit here. Uh, this was made available to the makers of Devil in Disguise and will probably be released in time. And yes, it was released uh, in Devil in Disguise. So that audio has been released, but um, it has to be said, um, it's not, um, it wasn't released right in the beginning, which is also strange. Number 19, Nicole Kessinger's social media footprint. Number 20, Nicole Kessinger's work computer browser history. Number 21, complete criminal records for Shanann and Chris Watts beyond Colorado, including traffic violations and including extended family. Um, Crime Rocket has kind of covered those, but um, it would be good to have sort of law enforcement's official view on that. Uh, for example, the embezzlement claims. Number 22, uh, record of Facebook messages from Shanann Watts' Facebook page. 
Now everybody knows that there are you know an ongoing archive of Facebook messages. Um, we haven't really seen that from Shannon Watts. We've seen a little bit of that from you know what Cassie communicated with Shannon and so on, but um, it's unclear whether that's sort of done through Windows Messenger or uh, sorry Facebook Messenger or um, something else. It does seem as though we've gotten access to that via um, the realtors um, messages, which I think were done through Facebook, um, some kind of group Facebook messaging um, from Ann Meadows. Number 23, um, a record of Facebook messages from Chris Watts's Facebook page, and even if it's an unofficial record from his Facebook friends, screen grabs from you know the the archives whatever number 24 no reference in the discovery documents to hundreds of hair fragments in the hatch of Chris Watts's truck as reported in the media and there's actually a hyperlink to that particular reference I must say when I saw that in the media I th that that was what um, um, kind of inspired me to think in the direction of the bodies being processed in some way, for example, hair being um, cut, um, right, you know, if Watts is worried about leaving evidence behind, you know, if he was disposing of his children in the oil tanks, he may have sort of reason to, to cut their hair, because hair is one of the last things that's going to um, decompose, and um, in the, um, I'm not going to name the case, but it's a case in England, where an author was um, disposed of in a cesspit uh, when they recovered her body um, virtually nothing was um, um, in a state to be tested forensically except her hair and in that case they found traces of a, a drug um, a drug that she was taking I think for anxiety or something and she had very very she had toxic levels of that drug in her hair and um, it was also progressive. So in other words, there's certain parts of her hair that had a lot more of the drug than others, which showed that she'd been um, poisoned over time. And so um, I just wondered whether there could be any similarity there, right? And then, um, yeah, that, that sort of narrative went nowhere because there was no nothing in the discovery about hair fragments. So um, that brings us to number 25, um, no explanation for when the orange t-shirt image was taken or where, uh, also no sort of definitive confirmation that it was what, uh, it's, it's true crime rocket science's contention that it may well have been him, um, although I know a lot of people say that they don't think it was him. Um, my question is why is it in the discovery if it's not relevant and that it does sort of look like him also know that he changed clothing quite a few times. Watch is also in the habit of putting his glasses on his head that way. Um, but again, it would just be good to get proper confirmation <coughs> on some of these details. Number 26, um, analysis of the smears and stains on the pillowcases and sheet thrown in the trash. Analysis, not um, just sort of words, like like what, what was the actual um, DNA um, result, you know, of testing um, evidence items like that. Okay, and then that brings us to a couple of inconclusive items. I've listed um, 12 there. I'm not going to go through them here, but they are certainly worth um, going through. One of them, for example, was when did Kessinger begin a relationship with Watts exactly? Um, why did Chris Watts take the plea deal exactly? Why did Cindy Watts accuse prosecutors of coercion, Chris Watts' sexual history, and so on? Um, but that's not um, absolutely central to the crime. And so now we circle back to the ring doorbell footage. And there's an aspect here that is very, um, very interesting, very curious, and even very sinister. Um, the fact that we've got this difficult angle from the neighbor's camera, from Trisnastich's camera. We've got this difficult angle, you know, under the alcove, over two cars, um, sort of between the um, residence wall and the, the foliage of the trees, 
over Chris Watts's truck and then sort of under the truck and over the truck to the other side and and then it's that sort of narrow little keyhole that tunnel where we get this little bit of um, footage of what Chris Watts was doing that morning right and as terrible as that footage was it was nevertheless very um, compelling you, you could see certainly exactly what time Watts was out there you could see that he was quite busily walking to and fro and um, he made several trips he made more than three trips uh, back and forth he also moved the truck um, to within the garage door so it slightly backed it slightly within the garage but then he also backed it he sort of drove it slightly forward and then continued walking up and down so you know what was going on then um, and you know what is really weird is we've got the ring doorbell footage of Shanann arriving and it's very very clear it's a very very clear view of not only Shanann but the driveway behind her and so then the, the question then arises why isn't <laughs> why is it's just such an obvious question why isn't there footage of what's doing whatever he was doing from the ring doorbell right why isn't there footage of what's um, wandering across the driveway from the ring doorbell now you could argue and say well you can't see because it's blocked off but it's uh, the exact same argument from the neighbor you can't see things very well I can tell you now you could see much better from the ring doorbell um, you might not see things all the time but bear in mind what is mostly walking on that side of the driveway on 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 that um, you know viewpoint from the camera perspective of that side of the driveway and so where's that camera footage right that would really be quite definitive um, if you wanted to address the question of you know was he loading um, dead bodies or were children running around that would be quite definitive in showing them because if they were on that side of the of the driveway then 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 the ring doorbell camera would have shown it now it may be that uh, Chris Watts um, deleted the um, ring doorbell footage of himself leaving if so that's not mentioned um, it's not acknowledged by the discovery either it's not brought up by the interrogators either and uh, what is very interesting and I'm going to end off on this point is when the district attorney referred to the video footage in the um, sentencing hearing he referred to um, the ring doorbell footage and I don't know if that was a slip of the tongue I don't know whether he didn't know I don't know what was going on um, it could be that he simply um, misstated himself um, because I think he was referring to the ring doorbell of the neighbor but why would he refer to it in that way so I'm, I'm talking about um, referring to ring doorbell footage of what's walking in and out uh, three times again it's uh, part of the the ongoing um, mystery surrounding this case it's a crazy case because as I say you've got so much information and yet um, it's almost like all the essential information simply isn't there thank you for listening uh, if you'd like more analysis um, you know in this kind of um, you know uh, very analytical sort of area and um, testing evidence and thinking about evidence uh, please um, consider buying one of my books uh, they, they turn out um, one of the best dealing with the discovery is drilling through discovery and uh, it's also one of the highest reviewed uh, thank you for listening and I'll see you guys next time.